Uh, friends, welcome. Can you hear me out there? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Welcome. I'm Hitesh Hathi. I'm with the Mithil Institute. And on behalf of all of us at the Mithil Institute, it's really a great pleasure to welcome you all here for the first Harish C. Mahindra lecture since COVID. Um, so please welcome. And you know we're celebrating uh, an extraordinary person here. So let me just, be before I do anything, say, how many of you have a Madhur Jafri cookbook, have cooked from a Madhur Jafri recipe, <laughs> learned how to cook from Madhur Jafri? <laughs> that includes Obijit. <laughs> so, uh, so really, um, that's a way of saying it's really just a distinct honor to have Madhur Jafri here with us to help us restart this distinguished lecture series. And we'll hear more about the series in a second, along with an old friend and a gentleman distinguished in his own right, Abhijit Banerjee. Abhijit, thank you for joining us. And you know, before we get to their intro introductions, I just want to reflect for a moment because it really is a very fitting and extraordinary moment. We in the Mithil Institute, we began this year, the academic year, with a historic conversation between two giants of modern South Asia, um, Sayed Babar Ali Saab and Professor Amartya Sen. With Leela Gandhi, they were talking about their experience of the last 85 year, 75 years of independence. We followed that with a concert by one of the most creative young artists in the region, Pakistani singer and musician Ali Sethi. Ali, uh, before a crowd of 1,200, he sang of what he called the unpartitioned heart. And so maybe I want to say, as we are nearing the end of the academic year, this is not really the end. It's a completion of this journey with two extraordinary and distinguished people um, here for the Mahindra lecture. And before we uh, go on, let me ask my colleague Tarun. Tarun is the faculty director of the Mithil Institute. He's, the, he's a professor at the Harvard Business School. If you ever wonder why the Mithil Institute does so much, and just about everything, including things that don't normally fit in the range of academia. It's because Tarun is interested in almost everything in a very deep way. Actually, why am I saying almost? In everything. Uh, uh, and it's both difficult and wonderful. He has guided this institution for about 10 years. Along with his deep academic work, he's also maintained the richest connections with civil society, with the creative community, with entrepreneurs, um, so, Tarun Khanna, please tell us about the Mahindra lecture. Uh, thank you, Hitesh, and uh, thank you to our two, two guests and eminences for being here with us today, and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, before we do anything else, could we just have a little bit of a round of applause for the team, the Mithil Institute team that has just been... It's always amazing to me that we end up doing so much at this institute, but vanishingly small amount is done by me. Uh, we just have an extraordinary team, so thank you for that, and thank you, Hitesh. Uh, my task is very simple. It'll probably take a minute, a minute and a half, um, and it's to acknowledge the extraordinary generosity of uh, the Mahindra family generally, and in particular, the, 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 the generosity that they um, expressed through endowing the Harishi Mahindra lecture series. I'd like to say a few words about it. Um, it was inspired by Harish Mahindra's passion for education, uh, which I most think of um, uh, as manifest in not just his commitment to education of men and women at, of all ages, but also for creating the United World College, um, which I know many people in the room have had some exposure to, uh, which is located in Pune in India. Um, He's also, of course, an extraordinary yeah, industrialist, founding chairman of a steel company that's part of the Mahindra Group, and a director of Mahindra and Mahindra. Uh, the, the, the lecture series is, is meant to, in a very encompassing sense, um, invite um, uh, eminences who have really shaped the fabric of society in India, um, considered very broadly. And just to give you a sense, um, we've, we've probably had I've been at the helm of uh, this, this institute uh, as, the, as the founding director since 20, 
I forget, 20, 10, more than 10 years, 12 years, 13 years. And we've had about eight or nine uh, uh, Mahindra speakers. It's supposed to be an annual series, but we interpret it pretty liberally. It has to be somebody who meets the standard. Uh, and the logistics have to comply, which turns out not just in COVID times, but in, in multiple, multiple instances has been quite difficult. We've had politicians. My favorite was uh, 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 President Kalam, uh, who was just extraordinary. Um, uh, uh, I remember him uh, uh, treating uh, a whole room full of Nobel Prize winners um, uh, as though they were little children, and they responded to his, uh, to his extraordinary charisma. Uh, and of course, our community of students and scholars and so on. We had the entrepreneur and I suppose activist in a sense, technology evangelist, activist Nanda Nilkani to give us a fabulous lecture. Um, we had Devki Jain, uh, the eminent uh, feminist economist and writer. We had a photographer, we had TM Krishna, the Carnatic musician. So it's just a very broad range uh, of folks. Um, the one area that we've not had somebody yet, I think, is in the pure sciences. and. Uh, Anybody has any recommendations, please do, uh, please do reach out and let me know. Uh, and Anand Mahindra, who is our immediate contact point and, and alumnus of the school, um, I had asked him once to allow me to bend the terms of the Mahindra lecture and invite uh, someone I considered a personal mentor to me until he sadly passed away, Abed Bhai, uh, the founder of uh, Sir Fazli Hassan Abed, the chairperson and founder of BRAC, who had a, a huge impact on my life. Um, and of course, he generously agreed because Abid Bhai, in a sense, through his extraordinary uh, stewardship of the Brack Institute, the world's largest NGO now, had really shaped India as well and all and the global south. But without further ado, I'm so pleased uh, that Mother Jaffrey has joined us uh, and that uh, Abhijit Banerjee is here to carry on the conversation. And thank you all for being here. So may we have the lights down? I want to just show a short video before we start. Actually, Madhurji and Abhijit, you may want to see if you can turn around a little. In this series, I'm going to show you how to cook all kinds of Indian food. Some of it you may be familiar with, the kind of food you've had in Indian restaurants, and some of it you've probably never eaten. It's the kind of food you get in Indian homes. Today we've got world famous chef Madhur Jaffrey. A mission to excite Western palates led to her being described as the original Spice Girl. She is the authority on Indian cooking. One of the things I'm going to make is Rogan Josh. This is a classical North Indian dish. It's lamb in a red, rich sauce. Into that goes about a teaspoon of whole mustard seeds. They're going to start popping. And then some curry leaves. Now these are fresh leaves. They're wonderful. They're used a lot in the South and they make a lot of noise. There was a time when Britain ruled India, but it seems that now Indian food rules Britain. You've given us a, a window onto a cuisine that very few people here know. I thank you, Madam. Thank you. The talents go way beyond the kitchen to the big screen and the written word. It was because of your award-winning performance in, in uh, the 1965 uh, Shakespeare Walla yes. that you were, you were noticed and considered the actress who could cook. Marlon Brando was my hero, and I wanted to be another Marlon Brando, and I thought, you know, what, what is there to this? But I wouldn't get work, because I looked like me. Just kissing someone. Oh. Everyone knows what they're like, these English girls, and today I've seen with my own two eyes. You don't know anything. Eyes are closed all the time. What do you think you're doing? You stole it from me. Look at you, everything you're wearing is mine. This is absolutely my first time. We know each other a long time. Well, based on the examination that we just ran and the complaints you've described to me, it's my opinion that you are experiencing the early symptoms of Parkinson's. I wanted to project an attractive India that had a sense of modernity. There was a deep, deep recognition and satisfaction that they were now on television in some way. What I started has not died. That's the wonderful thing. It's been picked up by other people. 
and it'll have a life forever now. So, despite Tarun's interest in everything, we're not professional videographers, but we put that together quickly to give you a sense of this extraordinary life. Let me introduce these true ex remarkable people who are in front of us and let the program go on. We'll have uh, Ms. Jaffrey speaking for a little bit and then conversation with Obijit, and then we'll throw it open to questions and conversation with the audience. Let me introduce Obijit Banerjee. He's an old friend. He's here partly because it's punishment for good deeds. He cooked many meals for me back when I was in graduate school, and they were among the most delicious meals I ever had. He has since gone on to become the Ford Foundation International Professor of Economics at MIT. He's the co-founder of the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, author of many books, including the seminal Poor Economics and also Good Economics for Hard Times. Obijit is a trustee of Save the Children, an advisor to the UN Secretary General on post-COVID 2015 development agenda. He's also an advisor to the government of West Bengal on issues of education and on the response to COVID-19. Of course, in 2019, Obijit was a co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics. And in addition to all of that, as I said, he's an avid cook and author of Cooking to Save Your Life. Obijit, welcome. And Madhurji, it's hard to uh, sum up your life, but if you'll indulge me for just two or three paragraphs, I'd like to say, Mother Jaffrey's, and I wrote this down because I couldn't trust myself, so forgive me for reading it. Mother Jaffrey's public life could be said to have begun with her regular practice of spinning khadi, hand-spun cotton as a child, and helping deliver it to a collection depot set up by the Indian nationalist movement. That is from her own memory of her childhood and family life in, the, in Delhi during the era of the British Raj. She turns 90 this year and has reflected in her writings on that experience of the Raj, of participating in the freedom movement, along with her memories of watching the transfer of power at India Gate, attending one of Mahatma Gandhi's last prayer sessions at Birla House, and witnessing his cremation at Rajkat. Jaffrey studied literature and philosophy in India, was a scholarship student at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London, and went on to become an award-winning actress with work on the stage as well as on screen, including, as we all know and saw, indelible performances in Merchant Ivory films. And among her many enduring gifts to modern life, she and her husband introduced James Ivory and Ismail Merchant to each other. So no Mother Jaffrey, no Merchant Ivory films. <laughs> of course, we all know her as the writer of some of the finest cookbooks ever written, starting with An Invitation to Indian Cuisine, which won the James Beard Foundation's Cookbook Hall of Fame Award. Her latest is Mother Jaffrey's Instantly Indian Cookbook, Modern and Classic Recipes for the Instant Pot. We widely celebrate her and have been for bringing authentic Desi food and food culture, which is just as important, to the West through her books, her TV shows, her work in restaurants. And essentially, we're celebrating her for her original and creative engagement with contemporary culture without borders. So it's not a surprise then that she is also the winner this year of James Beard Foundation's Lifetime Achievement Award. She's the first South Asian to win this high honor. Uh, in India, she's been recognized in multiple ways, including by one of the government in one of the highest civilian awards given in India, the Padma Bhushan. And I just want to say that you know we live in this era where South Asians play leading roles across life in the West, academy, arts, sciences, technology, music. So Mother Jaffrey, whom we have before us, she's one of the pioneers who ushered in this age of very rich and fruitful modern exchanges across borders with her extraordinary work ethic, her intelligence, her ambition, and most of all, her original engagement with both the West and her inherited cultures and traditions. Mother Jaffrey, everyone.
<clears throat> Hello, everyone. How are you? I would like to begin with the particular time, place, and uh, other circumstances of my early childhood in order to try and explain some of the compulsions that drive me to this day. So, I was born in Delhi in 1933. Uh, I was born into an upper middle class uh, Hindu family. And the British at that time still ruled India. Uh, we, I came from a joint family. Now, I don't know if you are all familiar with what we, this is an extended family where the grandfather, grandmother, are head of the household, and then in the same household are many of their children, their grandchildren, everybody else lives together in the same house. So that's how I was brought up. And this was a grand house, big house on the Yamuna River. Uh, my grandfather was a barrister, and he had uh, built this house, this large house on the river, and there was, the house was in the center, then there were courtyards on either side, and then running like long trains on either side of the two courtyards were rooms. On one side, it was a dining room, kitchen, pantry, and all that. And on the other side were guest rooms and his law office. My grandfather, as I said, was a barrister, and this, his law office was on one side. And of course, he used the office when he was younger, but as he got older, this office fell into disuse. It gathered dust. His cleaning man, his, his man, Ishri, his name was, wouldn't clean it anymore. So they just kept the door shut. But it was not locked. It was just shut. And I made it a habit of going in very often into this room because it had a lot of books. And I loved to read. I loved to read anything that I could find. And amongst the books in that uh, office were books that were called books of knowledge. They were like encyclopedias, you might say, but they had different kinds of things that I could read. For example, I went in and read all about the Greek gods, every Greek god and what the Greek gods did and who got, which god was related to whom and what travels they did, etc., etc. Now, next to the Book of Knowledge was a red leather-bound book. I had not noticed it before, so one day I picked it up and started reading. And I discovered that it was the history of the family, starting in mythological times, and then going right up to the end of, almost the end of the British period, not quite the end. And I thought it was very interesting. So it starts with Brahma, the god Brahma, deciding that our clan, our particular clan that I came from, was going to be have two castes. We were not just one caste, we were warriors, and we were scribes. We were going to be lawyers. There were sort of the scales of justice drawn out and given to us. We were going to be historians. We were going to be writers. So ink was going to flow through our veins, and we were going to keep records. So guess what I'm doing today? Uh, it seems to be my destiny. So anyway, so this is how it all started. Then it went on to the exploits of our family in Mughal times. I'm skipping a lot here. And uh, in the Mughal times, our, my family members were ministers of the court, ministers of finance, this, that, and the other grand things. And then on to the British times, when they worked for the British. They worked in the Mughal courts first, then they worked for the British. And one of my ancestors actually uh, was involved in the fighting and the fight for independence at that time, but we took the British side at that time because we had worked for the British and we took their side for which we were amply rewarded. So as I read this family history and the exploits of men, I noticed that from the beginning to the end, there was not one woman mentioned, not one. Now, I'm a New Yorker. I have lived in New York all my life. And as we would say in New York, so what were women? Chopped liver? <laughs> Nothing, no place. As I was growing up in India, it was the men who decided 
what the woman should be doing. In uh, earlier times, it started with my father, and then it became my brothers. But it was always the men, and even we who had servants in the house, the servants treated us differently. All the boys, for example, were like heir apparents. They were going to be men. But what were women? Again, not exactly chopped liver, but something close to it. <laughs> and they treated us, well, all right, all right, but you're going to just be a mere woman. Now, it was also uh, true in our particular household and our particular joint family that there were lots and lots of children. So we became friends with the cousins who were our age. And it just so happened that all the cousins who were my age were boys. Uh, I didn't have to pick that, it just happened that way. So I wore shorts because they wore shorts. I swam with them, I played cricket with them, I went across the river with them to get watermelons from across the river. Uh, I did everything with the boys. And yet, they would become men and I would become a mere woman at the end of it all. So that consciousness was very much there in my mind. And as I was growing up, I remember this feeling of a great sort of intellectual roiling in my head, almost like a volcano that couldn't find a place that it could erupt or an area where it could go. There were no women uh, that I could look up to. There were no role models. There, were, there was no one that I could say, oh, I want to be like her, I want to be like him. There were just a few that would sort of come up every now and then, and one of them, I remember was uh, Jane Austen. And I remember reading her and reading all her books. And I remember the, the, the opening of uh, Pride and Prejudice. I don't know if you all remember that book. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Uh, Jane Austen could be so deliciously, genteelly caustic. It was wonderful to read. And I just read all her books. Now, the, another person whom I greatly admired at that particular time was a painter. Now, you all may not be familiar with this particular painter. She was part Indian and part Hungarian. And her name was Amrita Shergil. And she did the most marvelous paintings. They were sort of, she studied in France, they were modern, and yet she managed to find the fluid lines of India and somehow put them in. And I thought she was absolutely wonderful. She painted in the 30s. So I wrote, not like Jane Austen, but I tried to write all the time. I tried to paint, and at least I had these two people that I could look up to in some way and try and be a little like them, but I was desperate for role models. Now, the other thing that was happening in my life simultaneously was I was acting. Ever since the age of six, I was cast in school plays. I remember my first part was that of a brown mouse, so I hopped along, you know, <laughs> and did whatever brown mouse mice did. And, um, and then later on in life, I began to act more seriously. And here's the very interesting thing. We were a British colony. And as a result of being a British colony, the British, in their wisdom, would send us, I think from their educational department, I don't know what, but they would send us either a whole Shakespearean ensemble that would perform for us, but this was rare, we never got a full play, but occasionally we got a Romeo and Juliet, the full play, and we would all, father, mother, kids, everyone would go and watch it. But most of the time, there were like one or two people, like I remember Dame Silver Thorndike coming to the college where my grandfather and my father and my brothers had gone, which was St. Stephen's College in Delhi. And Dame Silver Thorndike came and read little scenes and things like that. And of course, all the children were there. All of us were there all the time. We knew our Shakespeare. I remember little kids sort of saying along to be or not to be. <laughs> that is the question. Whether, whether tis nobler, we know how to say tis. You didn't have to say it's nobler. You had to say tis. 
where the <laughs> tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of the great, of greatest fortune. So we knew all this. We were bred, brought up with Shakespeare. And I remember even in our school, I went to a, uh, it was called a Parda school, Queen Mary's Higher Secondary School. We had a, a stage, which was grass. It was outdoors and it was grass. And we did Midsummer Night's Dream on that. I was 13 or 14. And I was playing in Midsummer Night's Dream. I was playing Titania, the fairy queen. And I remember sort of marching out there and telling Oberon, the fairy king, off. These are the forgeries of jealousy. And never since the middle summer spring met we on hill and dale, forest or mead, by paved fountain or by rushy brook, or the beach at margent of the sea, to dance our riglets to the whistling wind. But with thy brawls, thou hast disturbed our sport. <laughs> tell him off. Tell, tell over on off. So I so remember that Shakespeare was not just a part of our lives. He, he, he was a part of our soul. We never thought of him as British. We thought of him as universal soul, Indian. That's what he was. Uh, uh, I want to stop here and tell you a little story uh, of something fast-forwarding a little bit to my father. Now, I had um, got, studied acting, uh, done films and won the Best Actress Award at uh, the Berlin Film Festival, which you saw, uh, uh, the Silver Bear at the Berlin Film Festival. And we had come back to India and we were being celebrated by the Indian government. And I remember it was a glittering kind of occasional occasion in Delhi. Uh, Marlon Brando sat on one side of me. The great director Satyajit Ray sat on the other side of me. And uh, there was a little break, and I heard, saw my father go by with the vice president, Zakir Hussain of India, and he was telling him, acting is just her hobby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, didn't, he, he never took me seriously. Even until the last days, he never took me seriously. It was just, a, you know, it was just, just a hobby. So, uh, my, and, and don't get me wrong, my father was a wonderful man, but what he had was two perfect boys that went to very good schools, two perfect girls before me who were pretty and would find fine husbands, and then there was me. I came along, and I was sort of odd-looking and different, and my father sort of tolerated me and thought I was fun. And he treated me not like he treated his other girls. I was unnecessary. I didn't have to be born, but I was there. So he kind of just let me be. And he sort of enjoyed me. I was very different from the others. And uh, then uh, he did something which I thought was absolutely wonderful, which affected my life to a great deal uh, much later on. And he, he was a gardener. And he was not the kind of gardener who got his fingers dirty. No, no, not that kind of gardener. But the kind of gardener who sat in a chair and ordered seeds from Calcutta. And then he would tell the gardener, the Mali, OK, now you build this garden here, and you plant this here, and you plant that there. But we were the beneficiaries of his garden. We would go out into the garden and eat the fresh tomatoes, take little salt and pepper in our hands. and take the tomatoes off the, the little bushes and dip them in the salt and eat them. We grew our own beans, we grew our own peas. Uh, we had our own cows for the milk. And in the, in the morning, the milk was churned and made into buttermilk and into uh, uh, butter. And I managed to get those wonderful tastes very early on in life of what food should taste like. And my father was uh, entirely responsible for that. And the other thing that my father did was that whenever we had, say, a wedding in the house, the, the food was, there was going to be so much food needed that it wasn't cooked in the house. And we got special caterers. So every kind of family had their own family caterers who cooked their kind of food. And we had our own caterers who made wonderful, wonderful food. They would come up. They would set up tents 
uh, in, the, in the ground somewhere. And they would uh, then start cooking. Excuse me, I just drink some water. So my father was in charge of all that. And he would inspect, look at the cauliflower, see if it was wormy, whether this was right and we should have it or not. He would take the chickens and check their breasts to see if they were plump. And then he would say, okay, this chicken is okay, this is not okay, take it away. Mm -hmm. So he was in charge of picking the produce. And I remember they, these caterers used to make an absolutely wonderful tamarind chutney, which was hot, sweet, and sour. And in, into it, they would slice bananas and put it in at the end. And we just loved that. And then they would make the cauliflower, which is all wonderful. But the next day, you see what they would take the cauliflower, cut off the stem, leave it for the next day. And the next day, they would cut the stem lengthwise in either halves or quarters, depending on how thick it was, and then stir fry it, cook it, till it was encrusted with these hot, sour, salty spices. And we would pick up a piece, like an artichoke leaf, put it on our, in our tongues and pull. So you would get all the soft parts of the cauliflower stem and discard that awful hard part. And we just love that. We just love that. So this, from my father, I learned how the caterers could provide such wonderful food. And I learned the taste of these foods through my father. Now, my mother, on the other hand, was totally different. She came from not such a prominent family as my father. And uh, she learned to cook. She had to cook. They didn't have servants in the house. So she had to cook herself. And she was a wonderful cook. And she's the one who really taught me how to cook. And I remember going to my mother's house. And they ate in those days in a very Muslim way. They would spread a sheet on the floor. Uh, and then the men would eat first, and the food would be served to them. And what was left, then the women would eat. Now, during a certain season, which came in the monsoon uh, time, we had these wonderful, wonderful monsoon mushrooms. And they would be cooked in my mother's house. And then they would be served to the men. And the men would start eating them, and I'd be watching. We were going to eat later. <laughs> Are they going to eat all of it? Are they going to leave some of it behind for me? And then they would send for seconds, and then they would get more. I said, is there anything going to be left for us? And sometimes there was, and sometimes we just got the juice that was left. But even that was delicious. But it was something I learned uh, from my mother how, how to make, actually. Uh, and I still make those mushrooms. I can't get the particular monsoon mushrooms, but I do make it with other mushrooms, and it's a wonderful dish. Now, I, as I was growing up, these smells that would start coming from the kitchen when the food was ready, and I particularly remember the smell of basmati rice. Of course, it would be a huge pot of basmati rice because there were many members of the family that had to eat. So this huge pot would be start steaming, and the steam would waft, and it would go over the courtyard and into the house and come to us. <gasps> Basmati rice, dinner, lunch is about to be ready. And would that, if it was a simple kind of lunch, we would have some moong dal, which would be spiced up at the end with browned onions and asafoetida and a red chili that had been browned nicely, and um, cumin seeds. And then with it, we might have some okra, that had been cooked with onions and uh, uh, cumin seeds. And in the end, they would take green mango powder, which was nice and sour, and sprinkle it over the top. And what a delicious, simple meal it made, and how we all uh, loved it. So I grew up uh, in Delhi with the best of Indian foods. And I think what happened was that years later, I was in France with some friends. And my husband, who's a violinist, was um, lis play, lis uh, reading a um, uh, book of music. He was a score. He was looking at a Bach Chacon score. And somebody asked him, can you hear the music as you're reading it? And I thought, you know, it's the same question. 
is the food is exactly the same. Can you taste it before, as you are reading about it or cooking it? And I realized that, of course, that is the case. Because, and I didn't know this. I didn't know this as a child. But there is such a thing as a palate. And some of us have a good ear. Some of us have a good sense of uh, smell. Some of us have good eyes. But some of us have a palate. And we not only taste, but then we remember the taste. It goes, shoots up to the files in our head, and they are retained. And they can be recalled. And that is called taste memory. And that is very important for someone who wants to cook and remember what, how, what to cook and how to cook. So for example, I'll tell you, when I'm shopping and I go to the market and I see some beans, and the beans look very good. So in my mind, I'm saying, shall I make it with cumin seeds and slivers of fresh ginger and a little bit of lime juice at the end? Oh, no, maybe, maybe I'll make a paste of mustard seeds and green chilies. And oh, yes, and maybe I'll put some kalonji. Uh, what is kalonji? Uh, uh, nigella, no, nigella no. in it. And maybe I'll do it that way. So, you know, and you're tasting it. So you decide what to cook without tasting anything, but tasting in your memory. And that is very important. When they, you say somebody has a good hand, they cook very well, they say they have a very good hand. Well, the hand is a reflection of the memory that is in your head. And then you remember things and you cook them because you remember them. So that is something, as I said, I did not discover when I was a child. I didn't know any of this. But over the years, this is something that has come to me and that I have figured out for myself. Now, I'll move on here. As I said, I was born in uh, British India. But the rumblings for independence had started very early, even when I was little. I remember hearing about it. So we had already had, in 1857, India had had what is the British called a mutiny, and the Indians now called their first war of independence. And our family, uh, my ancestor, Givan Lal, who was alive at that time, worked for the British. And as he said, we've eaten their salt, so we have to fight for the British. And he did. They did. We don't know what the women thought or what they had to say, because mm, Japli were there. <laughs> so anyway, the men decided to uh, fight for the British. And of course, the British won. Now, the family for helping the British were amply, amply rewarded. We were given this huge orchard by the river, by the Yamuna River, where my grandfather eventually built his house, where I was born, and where not only my grandfather, but all the descendants of Jeevan Lal, many, many of them built their homes, and they are still there today. Uh, they still exist, all those homes. So we were very much rewarded uh, for that. And now we have to move on a little bit. It's uh, getting to be 1945. World War II is over. Uh, the British have agreed uh, to give India their independence. Hooray, we're going to be independent. But not before splitting the country into two. And mind you, not just splitting. There's going to be Pakistan and India. But it's not just going to be Pakistan on one side of India. There's going to be two Pakistans, one on the west of India, one of the, on the east of India, and India is going to be in the center. Good for us. Then <laughs> they drew a line right through the Punjab side and the Bangladesh side, what is now Bangladesh. So the line went through houses, through fields, through uh, villages. It didn't matter. Just a line was drawn, and this became Pakistan, this was India, and this was Pakistan. So India was a huge country then. So 
masses of people started moving, Hindus coming from Pakistan by foot, by train, into India. Masses of people started moving from India to Pakistan, Muslims who wanted to get to, to Pakistan. Trains would arrive with nothing but dead bodies in them, you know, filled with blood. There was mass killing. People, women and children were thrown into wells. Uh, people were asked to drop their pants to see if they were circumc uh, circumcised. And if they, depending on which side was looking, the person was killed and, you know, thrown away. Things happened in all families that were just unspeakable. In my own family, one cousin disappeared and uh, came back a week later, and he had lost his mind. He was obviously tortured, sodomized. We don't know what happened to him, but he was never the same again. Another friend was the head of a hospital. He was a doctor, and he called say that to my, called my uncle and said, there's a mob. Uh, I'm trying to tell them they shouldn't enter the hospital. My uncle rushed off. We kept saying to him, don't go, don't go. You'll get killed. He rushed off to try and help him. This doctor friend of ours, he told the mob, please, this is the hospital. Don't come. They shot him dead. So these, everybody in the family had stories, worse stories of people leaving the Punjab. And it was just an awful time. It was estimated that a million people were killed, but today they say it's closer to three million. So it was a, a terrible time for all of us. But what happened in our school, for example? Our school is, was a, a school with Muslim girls and Hindu girls. And suddenly, with this talk of partition, it was like the Suez Canal had been parted. On one side were the Muslim girls, on the other side were the Hindu girls, each proclaiming the right of their side for this or that. And I was always in the middle, always in the middle, pleading for both sides to get along. And I have to tell you, I was hated by both sides. <laughs> uh, it was a lesson to be learned, you know. Uh, I, I don't know uh, what happened to the Muslim girls who left India uh, during that time. Um, either they got to Pakistan or they didn't, and if they did, they must be as old as I am today, you know. Uh, but I never found out when I went to Pakistan, I tried to look for some of them, but I must say that I never found them. Um, so then I went through high school, and um, it was a question of what I was going to do afterwards. And I wanted to go to the JJ School of Art in Bombay. And my sister, and you would say, why do you consult your sister? I consulted her because my mother actually knew no English at all. She spoke no English. And uh, in those days, she was, had just gone through the eighth grade. And after she died, we discovered all these medals in our cupboard. She was obviously a very bright woman, but she was light-skinned and pretty, therefore pretty. You see, if you were light-skinned, you were pretty. And everybody knew she would make a good match, so why educate her at all? So she was not able to help me in my decisions. I had to turn to my older sister. And she said, don't go to the JJ School of Art go to a proper college in Delhi and do English literature, which is what I did. Uh, and then when I uh, graduated from college, I was acting. I was already acting in the theater. <clears throat> and uh, various people had come to see me from the British consulate and various other places. And they had suggested that I study at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art and offered me scholarships. And in those days, you had to get a scholarship because India had no foreign currency to waste on ordinary people. It had no pounds, it had no dollars. So if you wanted to go and study abroad in those days, you had to find some kind of scholarship that somebody from outside gave you. So I did manage, in fact, I got several, I got four scholarships and I could go skiing in Europe uh, <laughs> with the money I had. But at any rate, I decided I would go to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London to study. So my father uh, flew with me to Bombay. We stayed at the Taj Hotel, the same hotel, if you remember, 
that was attacked by Pakistani terrorists. We stayed there one night, and the next morning, my father put me on a P&O uh, steamship, and uh, I remember waving from a top balcony to my father. I was completely ready to leave, ready for I did not know what. <laughs> and that's my story. <laughs> So that that was infinitely charming. It, it won't be, uh, at least my part of it won't be. But let me. I'm going to <laughs> indulge myself. I want to do my fanboy moment. Um, I I had um, I knew when, when I came to the U.S. I knew how to cook, but I didn't know how to cook Indian food for the very predictable reason that we had cooks at home, or a cook at home, and he cooked, and he cooked adequately. And the only reason I cooked is that I didn't want to eat. I, want, I had sort of been reading about food, and I was greedy, and I wanted to eat things that he didn't make. And so those were all the things that Indians didn't make at home. And so I knew how to cook spaghetti bolognese, but I didn't have no idea how to cook uh, adal. So I, so. When I came to the U.S., um, well, I made various disastrous attempts to learn, but the f first, I think, step that I took that was actually smart was to buy her invitation to Indian cooking <laughs> and, um, and follow it with a certain amount of diligence. And uh, that's how I learned to, how to cook Indian food. So I, I I'm r remain, uh, since I cook Indian food um, at least a couple of times a week, every week, I remain grateful to you every week. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and let me, let me um, start by um, asking about your cookbooks. You have so many cookbooks, and they, are, they look different. They feel different. They, are, they have very, even the artwork is different. The layouts are different. Is there a project, when you go write a book, do you have a particular project? Why, this book is going to be like this, this other book is going to be very different from that one. Is there, is there a clear, is there a reason why these books are, they, they feel, look, um, they look quite different. I must say. Some are more personal, less personal. It's not clear when I start. The, the, the uh, editors always want to know what you're going to do. So you give them a phony something. <laughs> you don't, you, you, they want to know exactly what it's going to be, so you tell them something. And of course, then you start working on the book. And it doesn't always go the way you said it would go. It goes the way it wants to go. And it finds a path of its own. And as you're working on it, the ideas for the photographs begin to come. The idea of the text and how you put the text begins to form. It happens slowly, I think, and it, uh, it's a creative process that you can't predict, and whenever you ask to do it, you'd give a phony answer and say something. Uh, let me ask you one, one, one specific one, which I, I really, um, it was a big influence on the way we did our book, and that was, that's the World of East Vegetarian Cooking. Yes. That book, well, if you, it has n no photographs, it has illustrations only. Uh, is there a reason why you pick, that's what we did? No, you we, see. I love that idea. Yeah, it's, it's a, I wrote the book. My editor chose this absolutely marvelous, I think she was a wonderful illustrator and I still long for somebody like her and keep wishing I would find somebody again like her, but I never have. She was a very good, imaginative illustrator. And this is, was not my doing. I give all the credit for that to my editor, uh, Judith Jones, who was a wonderful food editor and did all the Machal Hazan, Julia Child books. She was a famous editor. So it was her choice, and I have to give her credit for that. That's a, the, uh, staying a little bit in that visual space for a minute. I, one thing that you hear about, I mean, there was this whole, I, I don't know, the Indian government in its wisdom tried to 
make uh, khichdi, India's national food. And there was this whole rather uh, <laughs> bewildered reaction from people in the West because it looked gloppy. It looked like uh, what it is, which is it's a, it's a gruel. It's, a, it's, it's maybe an extraordinarily uh, tasty gruel, but it still looks like what it is. Uh, do you, when you, um, and I think that's a, do you, a, do you think that's a specific challenge for Indian food, that it sort of looks, a li it doesn't look kind of structured and, you know, French you food know, is... The British referred, always I remember reading in all these old, tra I loved reading travel books from different periods of India, uh, and they always called khichdi a mess of beans and rice, remember? Yes. Mess of beans and rice. And I've always loved khichdi in all its forms. I like it when it's gloppy. I like it when we, what we call kili khichdi, which is dry, and the beans and rice are all separate. I love it in all its forms. And uh, I don't know if it's our national dish. Certainly it was, it was, our national it, it, dish. You it can't may or make may not something be, a national it was, dish. It was a, in our nationalist project, it was a step. Uh, okay. we, we, we decided okay. we have to, as a great nation, we have to have a national dish, no. and it was Kishri. We can't do that. <laughs> we are a nation of such uh, vari variation uh, that each area has a national dish, and to make one dish the national dish is a bit pathetic, I think. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not about to disagree, but I, I was more asking, is there a, have you thought about how would one make, I don't know, Indian food look sexy? I mean, is, 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 that, is, that, is that, that, that sentence? When it goes into the mouth, it's sexy. Uh, surely. <laughs> uh, but people eat with their eyes as well. People, people do eat with their eyes. Yes. I, mean, I have young children, and I see exactly that, you know, they, they look at the food with well, great there's suspicion. There's some, some things that look sexier than others, like a hunk of meat perhaps looks sexier. You can have different kinds of uh, grilled chicken that look pretty good. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I mean you don't have to. You don't have to entertain this question. I do think that it is a. It's something that maybe I thought you might have thought about it. Of how no, to. No, uh, no. Okay. I've never been bothered. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I just, uh, I just wanted to taste divine. That's what I'm looking for. So, when you. On that taste, uh, and I think related to what you were saying about uh, the 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 memory of taste, uh, how do you how do you land on a recipe? I mean, I, I, I so w you know, at what point do you decide? Where do you start? Do you start from from you constructed yourself? Do you take some other recipe? Do you change it? How 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 does the Process. It depends, it depends. If I'm doing a book, uh, say on the food of Andhra, which I have done, uh, so I traveled through what was then Andhra, as Andhra sort of Telegram, changed a little yeah. bit. Uh, so I traveled from one end of the state to the other end of the state. I decided I would not fly, I would go by car. So I could stop, jump out of the car and have, you know, whatever I wanted to eat, um, dosa, whatever it was along the way. And uh, you learn so much as you travel and stop at each stop and stop at where everyone is stopping to eat. And uh, I started taking recipes down that way. And then I would, I always then like to go into homes and get recipes. But people are, are wily. For example, in Hyderabad, they won't tell you everything. So then one person holds back one ingredient and another person holds back another ingredient. So if you go to 10 people, each person holds back different things. So you can put it all together and decide, decide what, what, what is missing in which place. So sometimes you just have to do a little detective work to get the recipe straight. And the other thing is I don't accept recipes from people like written recipes because they, they never know. They say yellow dal. What, what yellow dal? What, mm -hmm. what do you mean by that? Uh, and they na or they name a dal in a local name that I don't understand. But if I see it, they can write what they want. But it's when I see it and when I'm watching them cook, I see how low the heat is, how high the heat is, whether they're stirring gently, whether they're covering it. 
All these are details that people leave out when they're writing a recipe, and that's what makes the recipe a good recipe. And I think that's why my books sell, because I am like an idiot. I started with no knowledge of food, and I learned. And I, because I learned, I knew nothing, and started from scratch, I write in the same way as if you know nothing, and you're going to learn and get it absolutely right. You're going to make it like me or better than me, because I'm going to tell you how high the heat should be, how you should stir it, three minutes to five minutes. I'm going to tell you, cover it and put it on a low flame. I'm going to tell you all these details so you don't get it wrong. And do you, but in the process of getting there, you tweak what you people tell you? Do you try it out? Do you think? No, I you, never, if they send me a recipe, I know it's not going to work because people just don't know how to write recipes. It's not their job. They, they are not recipe writers. They write sort of generally, and they leave out details. Uh, but if you watch them, then every detail is revealed. <laughs> but then you, you keep it as uh, there, there. You don't change it afterwards. No, and I, and I give them credit. I'll say, this recipe belongs to so-and-so Vira Swami from this place or that place. I write. I never take credit and say, it's my recipe. I thought of it. It's their recipe. If you, 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 you went to Andhra Pradesh to do a book, uh, if you had to pick, and I know, you, you know taste, in Taste of India, you cover many of the regions, for example. If you had to pick one cuisine in India to cook or to write about, which one would you pick? Oh, I couldn't do that. I would. I couldn't, no. <laughs> But you have, you did, you picked, uh, you wrote a book on Andhra, so... You, no, but it was not a book, it was part of, uh, uh, I wrote about several yeah. uh, places. There's so many, I mean, the uh, Pesara too in uh, Andhra is so delicious. And it's, 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 uh, it's like a dosa, uh, and it's made with moong. Uh, green moong. Uh, green moong dal. And you soak it and grind it and make it into a batter, and then you make this, like a dosa with it. And it's absolutely delicious. So the, this is a specialty of a region of Andhra. So every part of India has these specialties. And how can you say that one is better than the other? Because they're all different and they're all incredible. I, 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 I'm appropriately chastened. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let me ask you a, a, a kind of a more nerdy question. Okay. Um, um, you, you've written a, a book called The Ultimate Curry Bible. Another one... That is a title in England, yeah. Yes. Uh, the Madhu Jaffrey's Curry something else, I remember. It's another, that's cur the Curry Nation or something. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the, the, uh, there's, I guess there is a... This uh, whole conversation, conversation about yeah, is what is curry? But that's a kind of a uh, it's a good example of this general uh, intellectual concern about cultural appropriation. You know, what right do the British have to take something? And what what do you think about that? Uh, that whole conversation. Okay, I've gone through phases. Yeah. The first phase was don't ever use the word curry. There's no such thing as curry, and that's how I started. And then I got weaker and weaker. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally said to hell with it, call it what you want, <laughs> you know. It's, it's just that you give up, because that's what they're going to call it, you, whether you, whatever you say. So what's wrong with it? I mean, I don't... No, why, it's okay. Why, it's why, okay. Why, why not let them? I, yeah, I, well, yeah. well, I haven't quite understood the, uh, the battle lines. Yeah, yeah, entirely. I've given up. I've uh, let them. Uh, yeah. Let them eat cake. Let them do what they want. You know? and, uh, and, I mean, so, uh, in, I, I mean uh, curry uh, has its... I've had curry in England, in France, in Germany, in Austria. It comes... It has... Each of which has its own... Unique uh, awfulnesses. Awful. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad. I was wondering, unique what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, 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 I, but do you feel that we should somehow feel offended or just feel happy that they have... No, nah, I've gone numb to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, 
I'll ponder that. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you one more of these kind of uh, nerdy questions, and then I'm going to open it up to the floor to ask better sure. questions. Um, do, do you, well, maybe two questions. One, one is you, you have many books with the word vegetarian in the title. You're not a vegetarian. Uh, I'm well, not, but here's the thing. Uh, yeah. We sat at this long dining table in, in our joint family when we lived in that house, which was one long table and then two more tables that added, were added on as children came. My grandfather sat at that end, way away from me, and next to him was his grandmother, uh, my grandmother. My grandmother was a vegetarian. I never knew it because I never saw her play. <laughs> <laughs> so far away. <laughs> so I, a lot of the dishes were developed by her. This famous cauliflower with cheese was yes. my, apparently Hello. my grandmother's recipe. So uh, there were vegetarians within the family that I knew not of. And I soon discovered and discovered their cuisine and later wrote about it. But we are a family where the women did not eat meat like the men did. The men were all Mughlai, you know, of the Mughal tradition, Sher, Shairi, you know, all that. Hunting and poetry and Urdu po Persian poetry and all that. The women, on the other hand, read the, the Bhagavad Gita. They were vegetarians. They were sort of a different league. But they all coexisted in some way. So that's actually a good word, coexisted, because I, I feel like right now vegetarianism, especially in India, but many places in the world, has become much more, you know, it's become weaponized in, yeah. in, uh, in, uh, in different ways. Uh, again, what's your thought on that, exactly because of your background? Uh, I, I don't know if it's, I would use the word weaponized. <laughs> Um, uh, in India, I would say yes. Yeah. Sometimes, yes. Oh. But I'll, 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 but it's become ideo way. ideological, at least. Oh, oh. I would say maybe more than that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I openly eat everything, <laughs> and um, I try and eat more dal and you know, just what's healthier. In in those terms, I try and eat what is the healthiest food possible, but I'm not a stickler for. I mustn't eat this, I won't eat that. I, not, not at all. Okay, I'll, I'll ask one last question and then... Um, uh, when you write books, do you think of how they will be used? Do you think of who your, uh, who your audience is? Who is reading it? No, what I'm just kind glad of to finish them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, on that, I'm going to um, open the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we have mics in the room, so if you have a question, just raise your hand, and Abhiji can point out people. If you want, you can start with them and bring it over to them. Is it on? Yeah. Thank you. So oh, what, sorry? Oh, uh, my name is Vibha Pingle. I try to cook Indian food. I'm terrible at it, so I don't. And that's my question that's going to follow. Um, I, I love your idea of muscle memory for taste and palate and how you have memories of what the food ought to taste like and you try to... It helps you as you replicate it, as you try to cook it. And for, as I just mentioned, I, I sort of, I never try to cook Indian food because I feel I can never replicate the memory I have of Indian food, eating that at my grandmother's house or my, you know, that my mother used to cook. She didn't like cooking, but she cooked occasionally. But my point is, um, so if I cook other kinds of food, I love Mediterranean food. If I cook Moroccan food or Lebanese food, am I just making a version of Indian food? <laughs> am I, so is it my muscle memory sort of, you know, I think I'm using Mediterranean ingredients, but I'm really giving it very subconsciously an Indian twist to it? I don't know what you're doing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. 
Uh, maybe you are giving it an, uh, an Indian twist. I haven't had your food. But uh, there are wonderful cookbooks that are of Moroccan food. Paula Wolfert wrote some wonderful uh, books on Mediterranean food, particularly uh, Moroccan food. And so if you, I think you have to trust yourself to a good Moroccan cookbook, if that's what you like to do, or whatever. There are good cookbooks around. And if you follow those, I think you will get the authentic thing. But if you're putting uh, turmeric and coriander and thing, then you are doing something else. <laughs> Here and then I'll come over. Thank you. Um, I'm Yaku Bangesh, and thank you for a wonderful talk about your um, growing up. And my question is actually related to that. Um, when you think of Indian cooking, since, since you, of course, like spoke about your childhood and everything, and that India pre-47 is very different than India now. Uh, it's, you know, three different countries at least. How do you imagine the, just the word Indian? Uh, where does it begin? Where does it end? Or does it not end? Um, and the reason I asked this question is um, I was having a conversation with someone a few months ago, and I mentioned some Anglo-Indian cooking, and this person said, oh, no, no, that's not Indian cooking. That's, you know, something weird. And I was like, well, you know, it's Anglo-Indian, so it must be Indian. Uh, so how do you imagine when you look at the word Indian and, you know, when you kind of, you know, draw the parameters of your books? Because I also noticed that, as far as I know, that only in one book of yours, the, the title says, you know, Pakistan, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Uh, do you imagine it that way? And how, how has that changed, perhaps? But how do you, you think see, of the word Indian? When I was growing up, there was only one India. There wasn't Pakistan, and there wasn't Bangladesh. So to me, that there is an India of old, which encompasses all these things, if that's what you're asking. And I, I think of that. Sometimes I think of India and Pakistan. I've been to Pakistan, and um, I love their food. And so I, I've written about Pakistani food as well. So um, I'm not 100% sure I know the exact question you're asking. But certainly for me, when I say think of India, pre-partition India is part of the world I'm in. I guess there are several people on this side. Uh, OK. Um, Why don't you go ahead? Can you, uh, can you, hi, here. Yes. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Nishant. Can you end this debate for once and for all if uh, there is something called veg biryani? What biryani? Uh -huh. veg, veg biryani. We often get okay. involved okay. in the debate that vegetable biryani is nothing but pulao. <laughs> <laughs> pulao. Now, pulao to me is one thing. Pulao to me is made with meat that has been cooked, and you take the broth from the meat, and you cook the rice in the broth with the meat and onions, and that is a pulao. But I suppose you can make a vegetable pulao, but I would call that rice and vegetables or something like that. Or you, <laughs> you could, if you want, call it a pulao. But if you've taken the, the most important thing in a pulao is the broth, is the meat broth uh, that you cook the rice in. And if there's no broth, then it is not a pulao. You might try calling it a biryani, I don't know. <laughs> but. Uh, it is rice and various things put together, and I think it's all right to call it a biryani, but I wouldn't call it a pulao. Yeah, please. Um, so I think that in the diaspora, Indian cuisine has really been defined in terms of, like generally people think of North Indian food and dominant caste food. Um, so do you think that this is a problem at all? Do you think that this is something that needs to be changed? Um, and especially at a time when India is really politicizing like the consumption of beef, do you think there needs to be a challenge um, in terms of the hegemony of what is considered proper Indian food? You mean, uh, is the question, should the food of other states of India be equally 
thought of as Indian food? Is um, that the question? Other states, but also, you know, historically, for example, oppressed caste groups, Dalits, um, and, you know, people in Kerala, people in the Northeast have eaten, like, beef, and that's been being really politicized, like, now. So do you think that should also kind of be raised up as also being Indian food, especially in the diaspora? What is the question? Um, can, can beef eaters be Indians is the question, I think. Can beef eaters be Indian? Not, not really. <laughs> no. Okay, let's decide what the question is. Who has a view of what the question is? I, I'll try. I, I, I think uh, there is... Um, first, is, is your, in your opinion, is the, what is usually described as Indian food upper caste Indian food. Whether it's true or not, that's one question to you. The second no, question is... No, no. It's all our food. It's the food of everyone. And it, there are different kinds of Indian food. And we all have our foods. The Dalits may have, if they have different foods, that's, that's, that's Indian food too. Everything is Indian food. If it's cooked by Indians of one group or another group, it is Indian food. Beef. It's a question of beef to me. Of course, beef is, uh, is Indian food. It's not only cooked by Muslims. It's cooked by many other people as well. It's eaten by other people as well. Christians eat beef, and uh, Anglo-Indians eat beef. Anglo-Indians are Indians. And so I think it's legitimate that beef would be considered, beef dishes, it would be, if they're Indian, would be considered as Indian as, uh, as goat dishes. Don't you think so? Yeah. There's a half hand here. Uh, Did you have a half I, hand? I think she. she I think she. Uh, that's she. Uh, she's next. Hi, um, my name's Sana. Thank you so much for this beautiful talk. You're such a wonderful storyteller and also so funny. So I was wondering, um, what's like one of your funniest food memories? My funniest what? Food, food memories memory. or cooking memories. A food memory or a cooking memory that's funny. <laughs> Nothing comes to mind the second, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's um, all right. You c we can move to the next question. Yeah, if I think of something, I'll come back to you. Uh, uh, thank you so much for, like you said, this was very um, informative in the sense about your life and just generally it was very... It was... It, it was nice hearing about it. Um, my question is, I think my biggest barrier in cooking as someone who's recently come out of undergrad and has met with the beast of cooking for myself is every time I ask my mom or my grandmother how I should make a particular thing, they'll be like, oh, andaze se dal do. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I just can't, I tell them, like, if I had the andaz, I would not be asking you. Of course, of course. <laughs> to buy her book. That's the <laughs> <first>. <laughs> exactly. No, I think he's absolutely right. And I... I'm <laughs> <laughs> Say buy my book. I say buy a good book that will tell you, give you the measurements of the spices. Uh, and if it's not the dish you want to make, you may come from a particular community that specializes in a dish mm -hmm. that is not in my book or somebody else's book. Then you have to s sit your mother or grandmother down mm -hmm. and have them make it in front of you, and you write down mm -hmm. what they're doing. Write it down. See, if they're putting a little... Uh -huh. you, you take, before you put it in, I'm going to measure it. Let me measure it. And you measure it. That's what I do. Just measure it. And then you write it down, and the responsibility then is yours. Okay? True. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Shreya. I had a question around you have thoughts about how uh, Indian cuisine at West is not very diverse and it does not represent a lot of states in India. And why is it so? Like, is it because of the migration practices or any other factors, especially in the restaurants that the food is served? Okay, is somebody has to repeat that. Yeah, the restaurants here, typically, they, I think she's saying, have Punjabi food or maybe occasionally... <laughs> Have you, have you been to Sema, Dhamaka? Have you yeah, been to any I, of these? But, but a, a small, that's a very small and new trend that's 
indeed happening, but if the app in Boston, you can go to most Indian restaurants, I recommend against it, but if you do, then <laughs> <laughs> you get uh, either Punjabi food or occasionally some version of I, South I'll Indian. I'll tell you what happened. Punjabis are ve very um, outgoing, and they are the first ones who went out and opened restaurants. There are two groups of people that went out and opened restaurants in the world. One was a South Indian dosa guy. They went and opened restaurants. And then the other was the Punjabis. And they did North Indian food, and the dosa guys did their dosas. So there were two kinds of foods that were originally in restaurants in the Western world. So uh, if you don't like the Punjabi food, you can also go to the dosa guy. Hi, um, this talk was so interesting and I feel very kindred with you because I grew up between India and London. Um, so I very much relate to kind of your cross-cultural experiences. I think something that I think about as somebody who's recently immigrated from India is that I feel like, um, I feel like I'm further away from my family's food traditions and like that food heritage. And so sometimes I think about like if I were to have children, like how can I pass those traditions and that heritage down to them if I myself feel like by moving I have kind of become more distant from it. Yeah, so I was yeah, just yeah. wondering if you have any advice for kind of second generation South Asians. What, what community are you from? It's such a long story. Okay. Okay. Um, my parents are, my, my mom's side is Punjabi, my dad's side is Bihari, but like we live in Mumbai and my grandfather's in the military, so it's really like all okay, over. Okay, so the, the two traditions then are Bihari and Punjabi. They're both good ones. <laughs> they are. Uh, <laughs> so at least if you follow some of the Punjabi wonderful Punjabi, I could do with a Punjabi paratha any day. I just love them. So you learn how to make the breads. You learn how to make gobi. Learn how to make gobi achar. Uh, the Punjabi gobi shaljam achar is absolutely out of this world. So you learn the Punjabi things and you learn the, the Bihari dishes. There's so many good ones there. And uh, ghugni, you know, wonderful things that you can make in, uh, that are from Bihar. So learn some of each and try and use them every day and then learn to cook them for when you have, I don't know if you have kids, whenever you have kids, you learn to cook for them and you pass it on. But learn your own traditions. It's a good idea to know what you, what you come from. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, and then, then you. Hello, uh, my name is Rakesh Mathur. Hey, uh, hey. A Mathur. <laughs> Indeed. So a question I have is, is it even possible to write a cookbook? Is it what? Is it even possible to write a cookbook? Bec and I'll, I'll tell you oh. why I'm asking that question. Because <laughs> when you write a, write a linear recipe down, put this amount, put this amount, a, lo a lot of things when, when I've observed my mother cooking and so on, it's just at the right time you need to put something. Or the, the, the frying pan or something needs to look at the right color, right? So there's so much uh, stuff in between the words that are written and what a, a, a really good uh, chef or cook might, might manage to do that I just wonder if you can ever write a cookbook. I mean, you can approximate a recipe, but the exact uh, the few different is, people coming in. The question is, can you write a cookbook? Or yeah, well, th how, the, 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 level of, the level of detail that you'd have to put into it yes. is almost impossible to... to it is not impossible. Okay. It is possible. Actually, I'm asking. You just because have because to how do you say that it's you when just do andaz it. or when, when it smells in a certain way or jab itna garam ho jaye. So, There's so many... So, likho, ye, ye likho, write this. That you, you take a frying pan, you look at the size of the frying pan you're using. It's an 8 inch, 10 inch, right. heavy. Is it heavy? Is it light? Right. Is it non-stick? You, and if you decided to use that for a reason, start cooking in it. How much oil are you putting in this pan? How, what is the heat? 
just write it all down. But so has anybody been able to ever write such a co complete... That's why her job is so... Uh, well, <laughs> of course, that's what good... I'm, I'm going to... Uh, that's yeah. what all uh, Let me are. ask another question. Yeah. Every good cookbook is just that. Yeah. Over there. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, in your opinion, should cooking be thought of as more of an art or a science? <laughs> it's neither an art, nor is it a science, though it has elements of science for sure, uh, because certain things, I don't know the science part of it, there are others who've specialized in the science aspect of it. How things go together, and melt or don't melt or gel. People have written books on that, wonderful people with knowledge. Uh, I don't have that kind of uh, scientific knowledge, but other people do. Uh, it's an art to a very small degree. I think it's a craft. I would call it a craft and a science. So I, I, think, uh, I think it's probably, it's, it's seven and we, I think we, we said we'll end at seven, so I think it's time for us to give Madhur an, an amazingly big hand. And, <laughs> and, and